Oliver, you're supposed to be asleep. All right, we're live. Um, I'll just we'll just give it like about five minutes. All right, we'll give it just like a couple more minutes and then we can get started. Awesome, sounds good to me. You guys are inspiring me to get back into YouTube because I have not been posting many videos on YouTube. <laughs> uh, what kind of videos do you post on YouTube? You haven't watched my channel? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'll be uh, sure to check it out after. <laughs> uh, so I actually that's how I started social media in general was on YouTube. Uh, when I first started, it was like vlogging and uh, how to study, how to do well in med school, how to crush your boards, um, how to do well in clinical rotations and things like that. Mm -hmm. But residency, oh, residency is busy. And mm -hmm. so I've definitely dropped the ball and have not been making nearly as many videos or like or any videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I had should... no idea you had a, a YouTube channel. <laughs> yeah, you should still check it out, even though they're all really yeah. old. <laughs> yeah, we'll be sure to post that on our uh, Insta page as well. Oh, thanks. Everyone to check out. Yep. All right, people are starting to come in. Maybe one or two more minutes. Yeah, and YouTube just rolled out uh, YouTube Shorts, which is like their version of TikTok. Um, oh, really? Mm -hmm. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, everyone's doing their version of TikTok, just like Instagram reels and stuff. Yeah, and Snapchat Spotlight and yeah, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, which uh, Snapchat was offering like a million dollars a day to the top creators. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I no almost idea. downloaded uh, Snapchat for that. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. I did not know yeah. that. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we can get started. So um, hello, everyone. Welcome back to my medical message. Uh, today we have Dr. Tommy Martin, and he's going to be talking to us about MedPeds. Welcome to our channel. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Guys, I'm super excited to kind of share my journey with you and go through a couple of cases and answer any questions that you guys may have. 
So to start with, I'm a third year resident in internal medicine and pediatrics. So that's a combined residency where when I'm done, I'll be completely an internal medicine doctor and completely a pediatrician. So it's a four year program. I'm in Little Rock, Arkansas at uh, University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences, where my beautiful wife and I couples match together. And that's where we're working at right now. So just to give you guys a little bit of background about myself, I grew up in a tiny town of Southern Missouri. Uh, Went to high school there. I played uh, football, basketball, baseball, played all the sports. Um, absolutely loved my small town um, high school. I graduated as valedictorian um, and then was able to go to college out in Kansas. So going back a little bit further in high school, uh, you know, things were not always easy. Like it sounds like things must have been easy since I graduated as valedictorian and played all the sports and did well in them, but that definitely was not the case. I grew up from a broken family that was destroyed by drugs, alcohol, addiction, um, adultery. And my parents had divorced multiple times due to drug addiction. Um, neither of my parents finished high school. So I was the first uh, person, well, my sister a year ahead of me finished high school. But outside of that, I was the first one to finish high school and go to college. And so I was not naturally gifted with smarts and I was not naturally gifted with athletic ability. Um, but through seeing what my parents went through and seeing how hard my mom and dad worked uh, to make a living and seeing my mom you know, wake up you know, at 5 a.m. to get us ready for school, make our breakfast, get us ready and stuff, and then go to work and then not get home till six or seven um, from working all day long, seven days a week. Um, she taught me a work ethic, um, unlike no other, that if you have a dream and if you want to accomplish something, you could definitely do it. And so from a very, very young age, my mom and dad instilled in me a very intense work ethic. But I also think that, um, fear of failure definitely drove me initially um, as well. And so like, I remember in the first grade that I was so obsessed with not doing bad that I would study for hours for a spelling test. You know, like I would make sure that I never missed a question. And so I remember the first time I missed a question on anything was in sixth grade math class. And this was my first time not making a hundred percent on just about anything. And um, it was because I went through it too fast and I missed something. And I like had a mental breakdown uh, because I thought it was like the end of the world. But that was only due to the fact that I would spend hours upon hours of studying. Like even in grade school, I'd wake up at 4.35 in the morning to make sure to study, to make sure I did really well in my classes. Um, and the same in high school, you know, I was not just gifted and could go through classes without studying. I'd wake up way before school started. So I made sure to work out, watch game tape for football, study before school even started. Like I'd try to have more done before school started than anybody else would have done throughout the whole day. Um, and then even after school, um, I'd go to football practice. And then after football practice, I'd stay with a tutor to make sure to get the grades that I wanted. So just to encourage those that may feel like they're at a point where like they're not smart enough or they're not capable enough or they weren't gifted, um, neither was I. And j just because you're not naturally blessed with all these things, it does not mean that you cannot accomplish anything in this world that you set your mind to. And so from there, graduated with a 4.2 GPA, um, was first team All-State um, linebacker and first team All-State um, tight end and defensive player of the year in football. Went to college out in Salina, Kansas, where I played college football there, played outside linebacker, and I majored in biomedical chemistry. Kind of the same thing. You know, I wasn't the most gifted, but I worked my butt off. I remember the first day of football practice, my college football coach told me I was the most unathletic person he'd ever seen in his life and that I'd never step foot on his football field. Um, by the end of that season, I was able to get playing time um, just because, again, again work ethic. Um, I graduated uh, Kansas Wesleyan in three years um, with a degree in biomedical chemistry. Um, I graduated with a 3.89 GPA, I believe. Um, and then I took the MCAT without studying for it, which I would not recommend anyone, anyone, anyone doing. So we didn't really have a pre-med advisor and I didn't really know how big the exam was or how hard it was. And so I decided, you know, I've always done well. I've always studied really hard. I'm sure that I'll do really well on this exam. Well, it's not how it happened um, and I did not do very well at all. And so since I did not do well, I did not, when I applied to medical school, I didn't get into, I got put on one waiting list in the US and then I got accepted into St. George's University, which you can see here on the right is where I ended up going to medical school, which is in the Caribbean. So I went to medical school there after not doing well on the MCAT. And that is where I met my beautiful wife, Phoebe. Um, so we met my first year on the island, um, her first semester on the island. Um, we dated throughout medical school, and then we got married during our third year of medical school. Um, we, at the end of graduation, we went to Africa, we went to Kenya, 
where we did a medical mission trip there. We worked in a hospital for about a month there um, as um, doctors <laughs> just finishing medical school, but that's what we were there. And so that was an incredible, incredible experience. And then Phoebe and I went through the match together, which for those of you that do not know, once you finish medical school, you have to go through a process where you interview all over the country and then you rank rank all of the places that you want to go to. And then all of those places rank you as well. And then you end up wherever you kind of match together. Well, couples matching can be very stressful because you don't know if you and your significant other will end up in the same place. Uh, by the grace of God, Phoebe and I did end up matching together at the University of Arkansas. Um, and as I keep going, if there are any questions whatsoever, please ask. And if I see them, I will make sure to answer them as well. Um, yep. so, um, real quick, I'm just posting all the questions in the chat. So you should be able oh, to see those. I, didn't, I do not see them. Uh, if you click on the chat button, um, it should be where you see the share screen button and everything. Hmm. Let me try to see here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not, for some reason my Zoom is like really, sorry everybody watching that I'm so technically uh, challenged. <laughs> <laughs> um, so like my Zoom screen is very small and I can't see anything except for you actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, then um, you can just, we can figure that out at the end then. Okay, and we could just add, you could we could go through the Q and A at the end. That's fine with me. Mm -hmm. All right, sorry about that. All okay. right, so we ended up couples matching at the University of Arkansas. So that's where we are currently living and doing residency. Um, so things that other things about me, we just had not just had. He's actually nine months old now, but our sweet baby boy Oliver, who you can see see there in the pictures. Um, he is just oops, sorry guys. He is absolutely incredible, incredible, incredible. Just the biggest blessing in the world. Um, we had him during our, I guess it'd be the end of our second year of residency. And so we're in our third year of residency now. Other things, um, I am crazy, crazy passionate about fitness. Um, I have done a lot of triathlons. Uh, so I used to mainly lift weights, but now um, I decided during intern year of residency, I wanted to show that you can stay fit and be a doctor. And so I decided to do an Ironman during intern year of residency. And since then I've done two, two full Ironman and seven half Ironman. Um, most recently I did five half Ironman in five days to raise money for pediatric cancer. Um, so that's also something that I'm crazy passionate about. Um, my current life, I am about to finish up my third year of residency, which for med peds means I have one more. Um, the picture there of me holding that uh, medal. I just tried to qualify for the Boston Marathon and ran a 301, so I missed it by a minute. Um, so we'll have to try that again. Um, moving forward, I honestly am not too sure what I want to do with my life. I love everything. I love pediatrics. I love internal medicine. I love hospitalist life. I love being in the clinic. That's not completely true. I enjoy it, but I don't love it as much as everything else. Um, so I don't know what I want to do yet. Um, I'm thinking either becoming a hospitalist or doing combined med peds, hematology, oncology. So I get asked all the time, like, how do you do all of these things? Um, you know, like I am very active. I love residency. I have a family. I have a personal training business on the side, and then I'm very active on social media. And so I'm just going to show you guys like a day in my life. Um, a couple different examples. So a typical day in my life, if I'm in clinic, so clinic would be the easiest week or the easiest time um, during residency. And so there I wake up at 4 a.m. between 4 and 4.30, a Bible study, journal, drink some coffee. Um, I'll get a workout in from 4.30 to 6 and then 6.30 to 8, I make breakfast and then spend time with Oliver and Phoebe and we take Oliver to daycare. 8.30 to 12 is when we'll be in clinic. Um, in residency, you'll start off very easy. You'll only see like three patients in a half day, but then as you go throughout residency, you'll get up to eight patients in a half day. So that's a patient every 30 minutes or so. Um, and then we always have lecture 12 to one, and then we'd have clinic again, one to five. In med peds, I'll have adult clinic in the morning and pediatric clinic in the afternoon. And sometimes I might have adolescent clinic in the afternoon. And then usually when I get off work, um, I'll work out and then spend time with Oliver and Phoebe before bed. Um, and then my other days, like, so, and this is a schedule that I create that I would highly recommend you guys creating. This is a schedule that I've had ever since high school or even probably middle school that I had a schedule just like this, where it would allow me to accomplish more in a day than most do in a week. 
And why is because you're getting seven hours of sleep, which every single one of you need to have, although it probably doesn't happen, but I would recommend it. And this just allows you to get so much done in a day. So whatever you're passionate about, whatever your hobbies are outside of medicine, this allows you to continue to do them and will help prevent burnout for you guys in the future. Um, so you should definitely, definitely um, try to adapt a schedule like this. You guys could take a screenshot of this or just kind of take notes. And then I have a quick video that I'll show you guys. This is just from my TikTok. Um, hopefully you guys could see it here. Let's pull this up. I don't know if you guys will be able to hear it, but this is like a full day in my life um, in the neonatal ICU. Wake up at 3.45, get some pre-workout, get my Bible study and prayer and journaling done. Then write my beautiful wife a note that she can read later. Get my workout in. Today was all upper body because I did a 20-mile run yesterday. After that, I take a protein shake with some flaxseed, chia seed, and cocoa and PB fit. Then get to the hospital around 5.45 and log into Bocera. Do all my pre-rounding on my patients that consist of checking all their labs, seeing how the uh, night went and doing some notes. Then the best part of your day, getting to go see all of your wonderful patients and their parents and spending time with them hopefully rounds will normally get done between 12 and 2 today was on the later side of things it was around 2 p.m when we got to get some lunch and i had some chicken with some veggies after lunch you finish up your notes do any procedures you have and then go tuck in and say good night to all of your wonderful patients and their parents and then usually uh tonight i'm supposed to have a swim but i'm going to skip that and i'm going to go spend time with my wonderful day in the neonatal icu wake up at 3 45 get some pre-workout all right, so that was a full day in my life as a doctor. Um, hopefully you guys were able to see that and hear that. If not, you could go check out my TikTok channel and see it there. Um, so then how do I balance and manage my time? Um, so something that's important to know is that, you know, we, we talk about time management all the time, but we can't really manage time. Time is a finite thing. It's set in stone. There's 24 hours in a day. There's no changing that. So instead of managing that 24 hours, we have to manage ourselves and be able to schedule out what's important to us every single day and be able to make that happen. And so the way that I've been able to do that is by creating that schedule that I showed you guys that hopefully you guys will use and adapt so that you guys can accomplish more than you ever could have imagined throughout um, undergrad, high school, med school, wherever you guys are at on your journey, where that this will be able to help you maintain your health and fitness, um, also stay on top of your hobbies and pre prevent burnout as you go throughout this journey. Because the hours are definitely long and burnout is real, but this can help prevent that. So now we are gonna get to the first case, but before I get to this case, should we answer any questions or do you think we should go through these cases? Actually, I just saw a tab from Zoom that had 18 on it. I'm guessing, holy cow, chat. can you believe it? <laughs> I just found the chat. <laughs> we uh, we have done it. All right, so I can answer some of these questions. Does that sound good? Yep. yep. Awesome. So, how has COVID affected your work? Why are children not receiving the COVID vaccine? So, COVID has affected my work in a lot, a lot of different ways. Um, one would be that we usually have a set schedule where we are able to pretty much know day in day out what our schedule is going to be like. But because of so many people having to go on quarantine or um, missing work for different reasons because of COVID, we, our schedule has been all over the place. Also, our patient load, meaning how many patients we carry, is much, much higher. So say if you typically only carry 10 patients, now it might be 14 or 15, just because the hospitals have been much, uh, much busier. Um, also, uh, emotionally, I'd say it is so much more emotionally draining. So I just finished in the medical ICU, and that is probably one of the most emotionally draining uh, months I've had of my life just because of things that you witness due to COVID and coronavirus and some of the things that are in place that just stink, just downright are terrible. So, you know, people having to die without their family by their side, like that is one of the saddest things I've ever seen in my life. And so it is very emotionally draining. Um, why are children not receiving the COVID vaccine? Because the studies that came out with Pfizer and Moderna, all these studies, they uh, children were not enrolled in these studies. So we cannot safely give it to uh, children without studies being proven on them. We are hopefully going to have that done in the next year or so. I don't know exactly how long it'll be, but if children were not done in the studies, we cannot give children the vaccine and ensure its safety and efficacy. Um, my first question is, what organ do you think you treat the most often? Um, wow, 
That is a great question. Uh, you know, I think it depends on the time of year. So like in kids, if it's winter, it's definitely the respiratory system because all these kids are getting bronchiolitis all the time. Um, during the summer months, it'd probably be muscul musculoskeletal in children because of all the injuries from sporting activities or four-wheeling and dirt biking, all these things, skateboarding, um, all these things. So it really depends on the year. In adult medicine, um, I would definitely say cardiac would be one of the big ones. Um, like heart failure, cardiac, um, and diabetes. So like heart failure, diabetes are stuff we manage every single day. Um, the second part of that question is, have you ever had a case where internal medicine would not work? Uh, yeah, you know, there's definitely times where you're kind of at the end of the rope. Um, so an example would be liver cirrhosis. Um, sometimes at the end stages of liver cirrhosis, the only option is a transplant. And if, for some reason, a transplant is not available or the patient's still drinking alcohol, things like that, you may not be able to. And then, so you're kind of at the end of your rope with all your options exhausted or cancer. Cancer would be a very good example where even with the amazing new treatments that we have, sometimes there's just no other options. Um, how long did it take to become MedPeds? So it takes, you have four years of medical school and then you have a four year residency. So after college, it's eight years in total, whereas internal medicine or pediatrics alone is three years a piece outside of medical school. So it's just one additional year. And what's it like to work in your field of medicine? It's incredible, probably the you know, better than I ever could have imagined. I absolutely love it. I love serving children. I love serving adults. I love getting to treat and uh, serve both daily. So. I'd say it's better than I ever could have imagined. All right, what made me become interested in MedPeds? Do you have any tips for current pre-med about how to be best prepared for med school and specializing in pediatrics? So, you know, initially I wanted to do surgery. I was pretty dead set that surgery was what I was going to do, uh, but I had a crazy awesome encounter with a patient that made me change my mind. Um, so it just allowed for me to have more time with the patient and pray with the patient. And that kind of led me to the field of med peds where I thought I'd have more bedside time to be with the patients and tips for you as a pre-med student to prepare yourself. Honestly, it's learn how to study. We all have different ways to study and, uh, have different study habits, but learning how to study efficiently is so, so important because when you get to medical school, it's as if there's a fire truck there with their fire hose and you're supposed to try to take a drink of it on full blast, which is just impossible. Like you're gonna get knocked on your butt. So if you learn how to study now, um, that'll help a ton, but then also build a great schedule that'll help you, which I showed you guys earlier, which will help you uh, be prepared to do that. Um, what organs does a general internal medicine focus on and in what ways do you guys diagnose a person's disease? So internal medicine is the entire body. So we focus on all of the person and all of the medicine, all of the body parts, um, all of the organ systems. And then in what ways do we diagnose patients? So by a um, history and a physical exam, and then also by modalities such as ultrasound, x-rays, CT scans, MRIs, lab results. And we use all of that put together to come up with the diagnosis. What common specialties do MedPeds doctors go into? I'd say cardiology is a big one. So MedPeds cardiology is huge. Um, infectious disease, uh, allergy and immunology, sports medicine, those are all pretty big ones. Um, but pretty much you could pick anyone that you want to do and they will make a fellowship for you so that you can specialize in those. Um, is, is there a common age group you MedPeds people treat? Uh, hmm. You know, I'm honestly not sure of a true answer on that. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the average age would be. And it would really depend if when you're done, if you end up doing both. A lot of people end up not, I think like 33% of people do both, 33% of people do medicine, 33% of people do pediatrics. So the 33% of people that do both, I'm not sure what that average age would be. Um, what's the main difference between med peds and family medicine? Great question. And pretty much uh, med peds, we get a lot more ICU experience than what most family medicine um, residents get. And then also family medicine, pretty much all family medicine, um, I'd say just about all do some OBGYN experience, whereas med peds do not. Some do, but most do not do OBGYN. So if OBGYN is something that you want to do, family medicine might be a better option if you want some experience in that. And then also if you want to specialize, then med peds is the better option because as a med peds doctor, you could still specialize in cardiology, hematology, oncology, GI, um, endocrine, but as a family medicine doctor, you cannot. 
Uh, and then, is it better to do fellowship after you finish residency for MedPeds? Yeah, so it, it really depends. If you want to do a fellowship, then definitely go for it. But that's only if you're truly interested in a field of medicine, such as cardiology. Like if you're dead set on cardiology, then you'd have to do a fellowship to do that. But if you like everything, then there may not be a fellowship for you um, to go into, unless you want to do a hospitalist, which there still is a fellowship for that. Um, let's see here. Wow, I have to say, you guys did very, very good asking questions. There's quite a few questions here. Uh, let's see what the next one is. What is your schedule work since I read that it's important to establish a routine with patients? Do, uh, oh, how does your schedule work? Okay. So it really depends. In residency, it's really hard. Your schedule is always changing. Every two to four weeks, it's changing. Um, but pretty much this, the slide I showed earlier was three different examples of a clinic day, of a ward day, and an ICU day. So you can look back at that and you can see what a typical day looks like on pretty much every single rotation. As a resident, you don't really get in a good routine with your patients just because of you have to do different um, rotations throughout residency. But when you're out on your own, you can definitely have a good routine and a good schedule. Um, does going into med peds vary greatly from just studying to become a pediatrician? Yes, 1000%. Because of half of your training, 50% of your training would be with adults. Whereas when you do pediatrics, none of your training would be with adults. So it's vastly, vastly, vastly different. Uh, different. Um, what do I feel is the best part of having such a uh, versatile versatility in your practice in medicine? You know, I think the best part of that um, being so versatile is that I could go to a place like Kenya and I could serve there and literally treat every single person I see. You know, whether it be a 28 week old baby that was not supposed to be, be born yet, or if it's a 98 year old grandmother who comes in, like I could treat every single person. And so that's one of the big things that led me to MedPeds is because when I do overseas mission work, I will be so valuable because I could treat everyone. So that was kind of my biggest decision on that. Um, what is the hardest part of working with kids in your job? <laughs> Probably the parents, um, which I don't mind because I am a med peds doctor, but sometimes it can be a lot harder dealing with uh, parents. And that's because they're so stressed because their kids in the hospital, right? Like this is their most cherished and loved and prized possession. And they have to put their trust in you to care for them. And so sometimes that can be hard to earn their trust. But once you do, it's such an incredible feeling and an incredible relationship. Do you ever suddenly get called in for your job during very late or early hours? So no, not really. So we don't really do call from home. So if we're on call, we're actually in the hospital. So we would never have to get called in. Um, I, of course, do get called overnight, but we're already in the hospital. So we don't do any call from home. It's all in the hospital. Um, kind of answered that question already. So how competitive is MedPeds for residency? You know, that's a really good question that a lot of people, I think, think is a lot more competitive than it actually is. And so it is competitive, but usually it goes unmatched, meaning there's open spots. And so it's not as, as competitive as, as what most people think. Now, if you look at the average board scores, they are higher than internal medicine or pediatrics alone, but still it goes unmatched and there's usually open spots. So I would not let it not let people telling you that it's competitive deter you from going into it. What's the biggest things that you've learned from MedPeds residency? Um, I'd say this is just in medicine or in residency in general, and that is that nothing compares to the time uh, that you spend at the bedside of a patient, that it is at the bedside and spending time with the patient and loving on the patient and getting to know the patient where I believe that burnout truly burns out because that's what you've studied for, right? Like that's why you've went to school for eight years. That's why you worked your butt off throughout high school and undergrad and med school is to finally be at the bedside loving and caring for these patients. And then when you're in residency, you'll get pulled in so many different ways. You'll be pulled to the computer to do your notes. You'll be pulled to so many different nurses asking questions. You'll be pulled to go do a case report that you need to do or to do this presentation that you need to do. Like there's a thousand things pulling you away from the bedside but like, that's why you did it. And so if you like quit sacrificing that time and spend more time at the bedside, then I think you'll feel more fulfilled um, in your job and in your career because that's where the magic moments happen. And that's where moments um, 
the indescribable moments in medicine that show you like, wow, this is why I worked so hard. This is why I sacrificed so much and it was so worth it. Um, so I would highly recommend spending as much time at the bedside as you can. Um, was being able to provide lifelong care for your patients a reason that pushed you into this field? No, not necessarily. And that's what a lot of people think. And that is a great way to think about med peds is being able to see someone as a baby and treat them all the way until they're a grandpa, you know, like, so that'd be a super cool thing to do as a med peds doctor, but that's not necessarily what led me to want to do it. What led me to want to do it was just being able to serve as many people as I possibly could. Um, all right, I think I answered a lot of these. So when I haven't answered yet, how competitive is pediatrics in general? So I'd say it's not that competitive compared to other specialties such as surgery, orthopedics, dermatology, plastic surgery. Uh, I'd say that pediatrics is on the lower side of competitiveness and um, you don't have to have crazy high board scores. You don't have to have tons of research or anything like that. Um, did I consider DO schools? 1000%. I did, I did, and I would for sure have went to one if I got accepted to one. I have nothing against DOs and kind of jealous of some of the training that they get. Um, how do I prevent burnout in med school and residency? So it's a lot of what I just talked to you guys about, right? So in med school, it's so hard because to prevent burnout, you have to meditate and think about a future experience that you're not getting to experience, right? Like you are going to med school not to have your face in a book, right? Like that was not your goal. Like you're not like, yes, I want to be a doctor because I get to study for eight hours in the library. Like no one says that and no one wants that, right? And so you, you're not getting the reward of healing patients. You're not getting the reward of being at the bedside of your patients. So in med school, it's super hard. But what I would recommend is in the morning, like write out, like write out your why, like remember every single day that you're doing this for the future glory of healing your patients, for the future glory of spending time with your patients and making a difference in their life. And so if you meditate on that every morning before you go study, it'll make studying seem easier. And then when you finally get to the bedside and when you're finally doing that and you think back on it, you'll think back and say, wow, like all of that sacrifice was so worth it because that experience I just had with that patient was just the best experience I ever had. And it made all that sacrifice worth it. So in medical school, I'd say it's different because you have to meditate on a future glory that you're not getting to experience right now. But in residency, my best advice would be do not, in, do not give up time at the bedside. But then what I can tell you on both of those things is get enough sleep. So get seven hours of sleep a night exercise daily, and try to eat a well-balanced, healthy diet, because those things alone will help you as well. And do not give up your passions, things that you love. Um, doing med-peds, do I get to do any surgeries? No, but I do get to do quite a few procedures. So one of the ones that we do very commonly is called a central venous line. And so that's where you put a catheter into the internal jugular vein here. Um, so that's a very common procedure. There's lots of procedures you get to do as a med-peds doctor, lumbar punctures, paracentesis, arterial lines, um, central venous lines. So there's a ton that you'll get to do. Um, what was a special moment in my residency? I have so many of these, but I would love to share one. So one, um, I obviously will have to leave out a lot of things just to protect patient information, but it was crazy late. Um, I should have been almost off work and I got an admission right as I was about to leave. So that means a new person coming in the hospital that I have to go do all this paperwork on and see them do a physical exam, do all that. I was very frustrated because I was ready to get out of the hospital. Well, I go to the bedside and this patient's very sick. I could tell that they're nearing death. Um, and it just so happened that they had a terminal cancer. So I get, get them up to their room and I took their history and I was talking to them. And uh, the patient said something along the lines is like, uh, doc, could you just get me to my room? We both know that I'm gonna die. Um, so like, they were really sad. They were, knew that their life would be ending soon and they just wanted to get in the hospital. Well, that definitely brought me to uh, like realization that you know, like I was mad that I had to do this admission and this patient is nearing death. Like who am I to be mad at that? I have the privilege to get to go serve this patient. And yet I started about it with a negative attitude. And then, so I sat in there with her, um, with the patient and talked to him for a very long time. And then before I left, I asked them, you know, if you had anything in the world to eat, anything in the world, what would it be? And the patient said, carrots with lemon. I'm like, what? Are you crazy? Like carrots with lemon? Like what in the world? She's like, it's 
my favorite thing. I'm like, okay, whatever. So I went home and I made carrots boiled with lemons. And I took it in to the patient's room the next morning. And as soon as I walked in the room, she said, oh my gosh, you did it. I'm like, what? And she said, you made it for me. Um, well, anyway, so I, I sat there, fed uh, the patient the carrots and lemons, and uh, then they ended up going palliative care and were going to go home to live the less, rest of their life comfort, comfortably and probably would pass in the next day or two. And as the patient was leaving, um, they just said, Dr. Martin, you made the uh, last days that I had the best they could have been. My mom used to make that for me when I was a kid, and uh, it means a lot that you do that for me. Um, you guys are going to make me cry here on um, Zoom. But so moments like that, like makes all of the work worth it, you know, like makes all of the sacrifice of medical school, of undergrad, of, uh, you know, the missed outings with your friends when they're all going to the club or whatever, and you're staying in, it made, made all of it worth it. So um, that was definitely a very, very special moment. Um. How do unexpected events affect your schedule? That's a really good question. I, you know, if it affects my schedule, then it just happens and I don't let it um, get in my head, you know, cause things happen, life things happen. Pretty, like for, for example, my boy has a lot of doctor's appointments this week. I had probably 15 scheduled meetings and Zoom sessions and stuff this week um, for different things. And, you know, I've had to cancel the, the majority of them. And so when things happen, things happen and you just got to roll with it. So um, it affects my schedule, but it doesn't affect me. Um, okay. Did I consider any other specialties? Uh, I answered that earlier. I did consider surgery earlier. Okay. So I think that answered majority of the questions so far. Okay. So I uh, definitely don't want to take too much of anyone's time, but we can get to a case presentation now. Sound good? Yep. Awesome. So let me pull up my notes here. So the case, this is on leg pain and numbness. Okay. So what I recommend anybody to do, uh, especially as a medical student, when you guys get into your medical rotations is whenever you're going to do an admission with a resident or whenever you are going to be seeing a patient, get the chief complaint. And before you go see the patient, think about everything possibly you could think about, about leg pain and numbness. And when you're a first day med student, the list might be like, they stubbed their toe and that might be all, you know, you know, or like, but as you go all, go along your differential diagnosis for leg pain or leg pain and numbness will get very, very broad and very long. And you're going to have things in your mind before you even see the patient that you could kind of ask question towards um, to try to get the diagnosis. Okay. So this patient came in with leg pain and numbness. Um, it was a 15 year old that presented with left leg pain and numbness. The pain started about three months ago and progressed in severity over the last month. So pretty much um, three months ago, the patient noticed just a little bit of numbness in the left leg, and then also had some um, pain that was like shooting down, a burning sensation that was shooting down the leg. The pain went from her hip all the way down her foot to her leg. Um, at first, it wasn't too bad that she was still able to go through her daily activities with this pain, that it was probably like a three out of the 10 and didn't really affect her too much. It was just kind of annoying. As it progressed over the next three months, um, she w could hardly walk. She had to use a wheelchair quite often. Um, the pain was then seven out of 10, shooting down from her hip to her uh, lower leg. Um, and then the patient, and I'm going to use her, but it could be he or it could be he or she just, I'm going to use her to be to like, make it simple throughout. Um, she eventually was not able to bear any weight on her leg. And then um, two days before she came to the hospital, she was having trouble urinating, um, wasn't able to go pee. Um, and then when she did go pee, she didn't mean to. So she was peeing on herself. And then also bowel movements. She was not able to control her bowel movements either. Um, she went to an outside hospital, uh, and at the outside hospital, they got an MRI, which kind of gave some results. Um, after the, on that Wednesday at the outside hospital, they didn't have anybody that could read the MRI at the time, so she was sent home. And on Thursday, she went and saw her pediatrician. Um, by the time she saw her pediatrician, she was unable to walk at all and still could not control her bladder or her bowels. Um, so this just just kind of a uh, recap of what we've talked about. So three month history, 
um, progressed over the three months where it wasn't very bad at first and then it got really bad later on. Um, it was associated with loss of function. She was not able to walk. She was not able to bear weight. She was not able to control her bowel or urine habits. Numbness down the entire leg. Um, and then let's see what else. Uh, something I forgot to mention, um, she, the patient did have associated abdominal fullness um, and then I had some weight loss. So then after you get this history, like when you go through the, um, like the long history of everything that you talk about, um, there's certain things that you need to ask about. And so be like onset, radiation, location, um, severity, those things. And after you get done talking about all of those things, then you go through a review of systems. And a review of systems is something that you try to catch anything that you missed in the history um, and make sure that you do not leave anything out. And so pretty much the way this, how this looks is you go from head to toe. So start at the very top of their head and start asking them questions about their body all the way down. So it'd be like, have you lost any hair? Have you noticed your hair is more frail than normal? Um, have you had a headache? Do you have any change of vision? Have you had any hearing loss? Have you had discharge from your eyes or your ears? Um, has your, have you had a cough? Does your throat hurt? Um, have you noticed sw swollen lymph nodes? And you literally do that all down uh, throughout their whole body to make sure that you didn't miss anything. Um, so for this patient's review of systems, did not really have any night sweats, didn't have any cough, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, pretty much denied everything, um, but they had lost a little bit of weight. That was about it. Um, so then after you go through the history of presenting illness, which is you're kind of getting their story, and then you go through the review systems, then you go through like their past medical history. And so this is literally past medical history, but then any surgeries that they had. So this patient, um, which some of this stuff is made up just to pr protect patient privacy, but had knee surgery after tearing ACL, MCL, meniscus, um, didn't have any family history of anything. This patient lives with the mom and dad, currently sexually active um, with men and women, um, denies any substance use uh, whatsoever. And then immunizations are up to date. So that's a very important question. I'm gonna say as a pediatrician, make sure to always ask. Uh, diet, eat a regular diet, allergies, does not have any and does not have any medications. So then after you do all of those things, um, when you are in your med school, again, when you're, thinking through all those things, be narrowing down your differential diagnosis. So ruling in and out things as you're asking questions and thinking of all those things you thought about before seeing the patient should help guide your questions so you can get down to a diagnosis. Um, so the next would be a physical exam. So the vital signs you'll always have, and as an internal medicine doctor, unless you're in the ER, you'll always have the vital signs before you see the patient. So you know if they're stable or not stable, sick or not sick. Um, even though someone with normal vital signs, of course, can be sick. And then so you go through their physical exam. So this patient had pretty bad abdominal tenderness. It was tenderness, uh, there was tenderness to palpation literally everywhere. It wasn't very distended. There wasn't guarding or rigidity. And so guarding or rigidity, so why we say that is if they have guarding, if they have rigidity, um, it raises concern for something that we'd call an acute abdomen, which means they need surgery immediately. So when we're writing these things, it does have like clinical significance and then does not have a, does, there's no hepatomegaly, which may, would mean a large liver. And then there's also no splenomegaly, which would mean a large spleen. Okay. Uh, the musculoskeletal exam, there was tenderness all down the lower extremity. Um, the patient did have full range of motion of both extremities, um, did have decreased active range of motion in the left, and the left extremity was a lot smaller than the right, or I wrote there atrophied. So that just means the left side of the body had, you could tell that it had not been used, that for some reason or another, it just was not being used and it had gotten a lot smaller. And then there's active motion, range of motion and then passive range of motion. So passive range of motion would be you're moving their joints through um, their full range of motions, and then active would be against resistance. So decreased um, against resistance. Um, the only other thing on physical exam was that, uh, which I, I should not have wrote burning sensation of the lower extremity because I cannot physically see that or examine that, but the patient did say that, but did have decreased sensation of the left extremity throughout the whole thing. Um, the patient did have normal reflexes throughout. So once you get done with your physical exam, this is the point where most of the time you should have a differential diagnosis and the top things that are coming through your mind and everything they've gotten from the HPI and the physical exam should lead you to um, a broad differential diagnosis, which is then going to guide your next steps. So your next steps means ordering labs, ordering imaging, and going from there. So what we did is we got a bunch of lab work. Um, so you can see here. 
that the lab work here, you guys will eventually, you, some of you may know this now, some of you may not, but there's trees to medicine. And so that would be like this tree or this diagram here. So this is how we kind of keep track of lab results. So this would be the white blood cells. So 21,000 is elevated. This would be the hemoglobin, um, which 14 is normal. And this would be the platelets and 300 is pretty normal as well. Um, and then this would be the differential on this 21,000 of white blood cells. So it's saying that it's mainly neutrophils. So in most things, you could think of neutrophils being bacterial and lymphocytes being, um, oops, and lymphocytes being viral. And then we have another tree of medicine. This would be here. And this is where we look at kind of the renal function panel, the basal metabolic panel, um, renal chem 10. Those are all different names for different labs that we'd order. But this number here would be the sodium, which that's normal. This would be the potassium, which is normal. The chloride, um, the CO2, the bicarb, um, the BUN, and then the creatinine. So these numbers here kind of pretty much all of this let us know how the kidneys are doing and what the kidneys are doing. And then this is a glucose. All right, then we had some other labs. So the AST and ALT and T Billy, albumin, total protein, all of these are liver markers. Um, there should have been an ALP here too, but these are all telling us things about the liver. So AST could be found in a lot of other things other than the liver, but ALT is pretty specific for the liver. Either way, both of these are normal. The total bilirubin, that's also um, a marker of synthetic function of the liver and how the liver is working. So hers is normal. Her albumin and total protein, they're also both normal. CRP is an inflammatory marker, which is elevated. And then uric acid, um, you can see this elevated in a few different things. UA means urine analysis. Um, this just told, shows us that she has some ketones. We could also see if she had a urinary tract infection. She had 10 to 25 WBC, so that's like, uh, maybe, maybe not. But then her urine culture um, showed that she had some gram positive um, in her urine. So she could po potentially have a urinary tract infection. Um, and then from there, we have this marker here, LDH, which this can be seen in a lot of different things. It can be cell seen in our, uh, red blood cell lysis or some cancers. Okay, so now we have all of this information and then we got some imaging to go as well, which when this patient arrived, they already had an MRI. So in the MRI, we saw, we found this. This is actually an MRI from Google. So you guys could probably go to Google and you'll see this image, but it'd be similar. So this MRI showed this mass here compressing on the sacral spine. And so this mass was leading us to find the differentials that probably would have been on most people's list um, of doctors. And that would be concern for some sort of malignancy or some sort of cancer or some sort of spinal cord injury. And so when you have, there's red flag symptoms of leg pain or back pain. And one of those would be focal neurologic deficit. Some of these would be focal neurologic deficits, which means you lose function of an extremity. It would be a um, uh, loss of bladder and bowel incontinence, and then saddle anesthesia or numbness in your perineal or genital area. And then so this patient, um, some of this again is made up, but had a biopsy of this mass. It showed Ewing sarcoma, and then the patient got a CT scans and then was started on chemotherapy. So the diagnosis that this patient ended up having is called Ewing sarcoma. Ewing sarcoma is a a tumor that is from the primitive neuroectodermal tumor. Um, it has different translocations, which when you get older, this will be on your board exams, these locations here. Patrick Ewings was a famous basketball player that I think had one of these numbers. I don't know, because I don't really remember that. It usually arises from the diaphysis of bones. And then when you look on histology, you'll see sheets of small round blue cells. So when we get the biopsy and you go look under a microscope, that's kind of what you'll see. Um, prognosis is usually pretty poor. Um, it can improve with uh, chemotherapy. So uh, just a little bit more about Ewing sarcoma. Um, it was first described in the 1900s. Um, at that time, we really could not distinguish between PNET tumors and other types of Ewing sarcoma. Now we have tons of different types um, and they're like more classified, which is out of my range of knowledge and what you guys would need to know as well. They usually uh, would present with pain and swelling of a bone. It really depends on the location and um, where the tumor can grow and expand, where if you're going to see symptoms or not. So this most Ewing sarcoma can uh, um, affect any bone, but it usually is the long bone, such as the femur, tibia, um, upper arms, the bones of the humerus. Um, also, the bones of the pelvis are commonly affected, which we kind of saw in this case here. Occasionally, um, the tumor can invade um, muscles and soft tissues, and that would be an extra osseous, um, osseous Ewing sarcoma.
Um, again, diagnosis is made by a biopsy, which would show those round blue cells. And then treatments most commonly would be with chemotherapy regimens. Um, these drugs probably don't mean a whole lot to you guys at, at this point, but they will one day, but bincristine, dectinomycin, uh, cyclophosphamide, and doxorubicin. Um, and then there's a couple other chemo uh, regimens that can potentially help. So that is this case presentation um, of Ewing sarcoma um, that was seen in a patient that I've seen before. Um, I actually do have another case, but just because of time, I do not think we are going to go through that case, but I can answer any other questions that anybody has. Um, if you guys would like to drop any in the chat, if you guys are still here, um, and I could try to, we could finish up with some questions and then I could just do some ending words of encouragement. Um, let me just check right now. There aren't any questions, but um, I will let you know if I see any more. Yeah, for sure. Well, as people ask, um, or if anybody does ask any other questions, I could just kind of go on with some words of encouragement. Um, I'm going through my the rest of my slides. Um, so many of you guys, you guys are all on, all on this journey and at different stages of your journey, somewhere in high school um, or medical school or in a gap year. Uh, just know that the hours are crazy long. And that the sacrifice is great. You're going to miss out on outings with friends, birthday parties, weddings, funerals. You will sacrifice a lot on this journey. But I can promise you that every sacrifice is so worth it when you have a patient tell you that you made a difference in their life or when you see the most beautiful kiddo healed from cancer or you have a loved one hug your neck um, as they just lost their loved one and thank you for loving them the way that they love them. Um, you know, like moments like that are indescribable and unexplainable until you experience them. And then you'll look back on it and know that every second of studying, every little sacrifice was so worth it. And so if I could leave you with anything, and there's two things that I would leave you with. And one would be that um, it is at the bedside where burnout burns out. Um, the bedside is why you started this journey. The bedside Spending time with patients is why you decided to become a doctor. And so please never sacrifice that because I do truly believe that's where burnout will burn out. And then two is know that life is short. And in medicine, you are constantly reminded how short life is. So one of my favorite quotes is that your life is a vapor in the wind. It's here for a second. It's here for just a second and then it vanishes. Knowing that life is that short we must live with such a great urgency and live this life to the fullest in every single second. And we must treat every single encounter. We must treat every uh, single word, every single thing that we do as if it will be our last and ask ourselves, what do we want that last second to be remembered as? What do we want our legacy of that last second to be? And that should, that should um, motivate every motive in our life every single day. So just live every second as if your life is a vapor in the wind because it very well could be, it could be gone tomorrow. So how do you want this last second to be remembered? And I hope that it is spreading as much love, positivity and joy and hope to the world. So um, I put a few more questions in the chat uh, that were just asked. Awesome. All right, couple other questions. Yeah, so Ewing sarcoma, um, can it happen due to genetic diseases? Um, you know, I don't know if there's a specific genetic disease that's correlated with it. Usually it's due to a, um, it, it would be um, a genetic problem, like a, a translocation in certain genes that happen. Um, but I don't know of like a specific genetic syndrome that would lead to that. Um, what helps me balance my hobbies and medical work? Um, honestly, that schedule that I talked to you about. So making sure that I'm up before the rest of the world and that I'm awake and working and doing the things that I enjoy while everyone else is sleeping. So that would be the biggest thing. And I'm definitely not per perfect at it. Like I fail often. Like this morning, for some reason, I slept until 8 a.m. I, I hardly ever, ever, ever sleep that long. I don't know what happened. But in saying so, I didn't work out today. You know, I had three other meetings. Um, so it just did not leave time for that. Whereas if I wouldn't have overslept and if I would have woke up at 4 a.m., I would have been able to work out. So I'm not perfect at it, but I do um, try my hardest to keep that schedule every day. Um, you said that you did not study for the MCAT. How different was it from your experience? 
expectations. Oh, like a thousand percent different. Like, like <laughs> there's no measurable number that I could tell you how different it was than what I expected it to be. But okay, but to be honest, I thought I did really well. So, <laughs> so like I walked out of the exam, called my parents and told them that I crushed the exam. That I was super pumped that I did so well. And I like probably scored the worst score in the history of the EMCAT. Um, how long does it typically, typically take to make a diagnosis? You know, I'd say typically not very long, but there are the rare occasion where it might take weeks before you figure out what's going on. Okay, so, but typically not too long. Usually, you know, in your mind and as you get more experience, like your wheels already turn and you come up with the diagnosis as they're talking and then the labs and imaging and stuff just confirms it. Um, so typically not too long. All right, guys. Yep. Um, I actually have a personal question as well. Um, has there ever been an instance where uh, you were unable to diagnose a patient for like over a week or something, something that you've never ever seen before? And uh, I guess something that's like a very rare uh, disease or whatever. Yeah, for sure. Uh, we just had a case recently in the ICU that it took, I was there for a month. It took us three weeks to diagnose it. Mm -hmm. um, so it just took a very, very, very long time. Um, it, it ended up not being as rare of something as what we thought it would be, mm -hmm. um, but it still just took a very long time because it presented very weirdly. Um, and so it was uh, micro microscopic polyangitis. Um, so just, it is kind of rare, but not as rare as what we would think for as long as it took us to diagnosis, but it's also diagnosed on a renal biopsy, you know? And so like, it does take some time to get that back and get the path results back. Um, so that would be something that, you know, uh, but there are many times that it takes a long time to d get a diagnosis or you may lose a patient and never get the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, but uh, thank you so much for sharing everything. Your journey was very inspirational and especially that uh, special case that you uh, presented and talked about. Uh, that was very cool as well. Um, thank you so much for being on our channel and it was great having you. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. And if anybody has any questions or needs any help along the journey, you can hit me up on any social media platform and I would love to help. Mm -hmm. And to the viewers, um, I posted the link to the Google form. It'll close at 930. So if you want your shadowing hour, please fill that out. All right. Thank you.